Good to be out here. I'm from Calgary. I uh, pastored the same church in Calgary for 30 years. I was 15 when I started that church. And uh, there's many times over the years that I've said to the Lord, okay, I'm done here. But every time I, I phone him, he doesn't pick up the phone. And I just get this answering machine that says, heaven is not available to take your call right now. Because you know what it's like for pastors. If you ever talk to Pastor Bill or others, there's times that, that you go, we all go through good times and bad times. We all go through times where we prosper and times where we don't. And uh, so some of those times, you know, uh, so I'm going to speak a little bit about that this morning, um, about what's happened uh, over the last three years. But um, just want to say it's great to be here. One of the things that, that we're seeing, maybe it's just our modern world, people are, and churches are changing so quickly. And, and um, when Billy and I talked about us coming, we were down here in St. John for uh, a meeting um, with a group of prophetic people, some Cana the Canadian Prophetic Roundtable, and so we spent three days in St. John. I'd never been to St. John before. Uh, it was really nice. I love this part of the country. I just love, we came down here last fall, and we were in a conference last fall, and uh, everybody back home was jealous because they said, you get to go to the Maritimes, to Atlantic Canada in the fall, and the people who were from here were like, okay, you got to go here, you got to go here, you got to go here. You gotta. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking at a conference that can only go one or two places. Um, but we drove over from um, Barrie, Ontario. We took four days and drove over from there to here to get to the conference because the two of them were a week apart. And it was just gorgeous. So you guys are, uh, you know, you might be jealous of our mountains. I live 40 miles from the mountains. But I'll tell you, I'm jealous of the ocean. You guys have the ocean. And every time I get by the ocean, it just kind of pulls me back to, you know... Uh, love being out here. So, and as I started to say, it's a pleasure to come to this church because this church has been here for a while. This church has got roots, it's got strength. And when you get a church that's been somewhere for a while, <clears throat> that church can begin to influence the spirit realm in the region. That's a little bit what we were talking about the conference that Pastor Billy came over to um, in Capelle uh, just the, yesterday and the day before. We were talking about. What does the church do to, to open something in the spirit so that the sound and the authority of that church go out into that region and begin to affect the principalities in that region? And this is what God's moving the last day's church uh, into. And so it's going to be exciting to see it. And, uh, you know, it's going to be uh, exciting. But we're, we're on a learning curve right now. And one of the things that COVID did was uh, it was an alarm clock. It's just exactly like my brother prayed um, uh, you know, people say, well, I and mean, we're faith people. We know God doesn't cause sickness and disease, and Jesus bore that at the cross, and we understand that. But when something like what just happened in Canada happens, it messes up Christians. It messed up the world, but it messed us up too. And, uh, you know, in, in seeking the Lord about that, and, and I've always, uh, we, we had a, a national television program uh, several years ago, and I noticed that when I was on that program and when I was broadcasting, my awareness of what was happening in Canada grew because there was a responsibility that the Lord uh, began to grow into me to speak prophetically to what was happening in Canada. And, you know, to speak about like the sons of Issachar who had an understanding of the times and knew what Israel ought to do. <laughs> I said to the Lord in the middle of the COVID thing, because we saw... And I'm going to share with you this morning, we're going to pull the veil back and I'm going to share some things, but I said to the Lord um, about halfway through COVID, because we were seeing what was happening behind the scenes, we were seeing the global narrative and so forth, and uh, I said to the Lord, I, you know, I've always kind of liked this Sons of Issachar thing, because we always had a sense of what was going on in the nation and, and somewhat, we traveled around the world with different groups doing prayer things and, and, and stuff like that. And, uh, and I said, Lord, I'm not enjoying this Sons of Issachar thing right now because nobody believes what we're saying. Yeah. And we didn't know what to believe because of what was happening. Um, so let's just pray for a minute. Lord, I just thank you right now for the spirit of, of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened that we might know the things that you're doing. You rebuked the religious leaders of your day because they didn't discern the signs of the times. And I find that we are in this day, Father, where, where we're so caught up in what's happening in the natural that we don't see behind the veil. 
and see what God is doing. And so we pray for that this morning. As Pastor Billy prayed, we thank you for a prophetic spirit, for the spirit of, the, of, the, of prophecy and the spirit yes. of the prophetic moving in what you want to do, not just in uh, Canada, but around the world. And Lord, we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Just feeling a little bit um, um, prophetic here. Sensing it with the Lord, um, let's 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 speak to some people. Sister, what's your name? Vivian. Vivian, I feel like the Lord is saying there's a generator on the inside of you that never quits. God keeps that generator going, and He says, "Daughter, there's things that still have to come out of you for the sake of others, for the sake of those who are younger, for the sake of those who don't understand." You're like a generator. You produce power, and I'm going to plug people into you so that you can bless them, so that you can strengthen them. So don't don't think you're going to be sitting at home knitting and taking care of things because I'm going to begin to bring things out of you that others need. So get ready for me to say, all right, flip the switch. There's, it's almost like over the years you've charged a number of different batteries, and now the Lord's putting all the batteries together, and he's saying, okay, the batteries are ready to go, and I'm going to flip the switch. So whatever that means for you, get ready. that make any sense to you? The ladies behind you are laughing, so that's a good sign. <laughs> What's your name, sir? Yep. Huh? Klauju. Klauju. You speak English well? No. <laughs> From? Brazil. Brazil. Portuguese. I worked with some Portuguese guys when I was driving truck. And the only words that I learned for them are words I can't say in English. <laughs> but they would look at me and go, cabeza. In other words, there's something wrong with your head. <laughs> all right, all right, and are you guys family? Do you speak Portuguese? Oh, you don't? oh okay. I thought maybe you were the... You can translate it later if you get some. Yeah. He's probably, he's got Google Translate on his phone. You know, you can get that now where, where it will translate in real time. And you go to another country and you punch that thing into your phone and it'll translate your language to the person and the person reads it. God's made you a pillar and he's given you strength and he's given you a gift. I see a professionalism on you. I feel like the Lord is, is saying, son, I want to stretch you and take you further than where you've been. You're strong, you stand, you're not easily moved. But the Lord's going to begin to move you and bend you because he wants to make you more flexible. Uh, the illustration comes here very clearly. You know, I, I was wondering when we showed up here uh, last Monday and drove down St. John from Moncton, uh, I said, man, there's a lot of trees blow down here. Like, these guys must have lousy trees or something. And I just didn't, I didn't put together the hurricane until I got told a couple of days later, well, no, the, the reason, and then, of course, coming up here on the island and seeing these big honking trees. When we were in Hawaii... Uh, a hurricane passed by over a couple of the islands, so we got some of the wind. And I watched this, that, that in the hurricane over there, all the trees go like this. And they'll bend right over. The trees are made for the hurricanes. But trees in Canada aren't. We've got our, our uh, deciduous trees that are strong, and they stand, and when the wind comes, they break. I feel like you've become a strong tree but God's brought you here, and he's going to begin to bend you. He's going to begin to let you flex and move. So trust him when something comes towards you that you're like, mm, I don't really know about that. Trust the Lord that you'll be flexible the same way that a bow on a bow and arrow, when you pull the arrow back, it bends in order to release power. So you're... You can be stubborn, like a stick in the mud. 
but God's going to use the strength that you have, but he's going to teach you to bend so that greater power is released through you. What, what do you do? What's your occupation? Job. He patents intellectual property. Hence the word professionalism. What the heck is that? <laughs> patents intellectual property. I should be so blessed to have intellectual property. <laughs> Let me share this with you this morning. I'm going to have to go fast, so you're going to have to listen fast. <laughs> How'd you enjoy that last three years, anyways? <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah, it sucked, didn't it? Pardon my, yeah, my Western. Something we've never experienced in Canada before, and something that the world has never experienced before. The, for the first time in the history of the church, the church in the world was shut down. For that first three months, nobody met all over the world. It was the first time in the last 2,000 years that the sound of singing as the church comes together was not heard in the earth. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear something like that, when I watch something like that, I'm like, wait a minute, the sound of the voice of the church has just been completely shut down. Because I think of everything in terms of, of, okay, what's happening in the natural is a reflection of what's happening in the spiritual. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of this that I'm going to read to you today simply because of the data that I want to uh, pass over. And so what I'm going to do today, th this morning, I'm going to give you the bad news. Paul said uh, regarding the enemy, we are not unaware of his devices. <clears throat> and then he, he added this to it, lest Satan take, take advantage of us. So he said that in 2 Corinthians 2, if, if we are unaware of the devices of the enemy, he takes advantage of us, and what happened to us in the last three years, we began to respond in the natural, and we got taken advantage of. And, and some of us stood up at some points, and I'll, I'll share a little bit about that with what happened to our church. So it's critical for us in the body of Christ to be able to interpret the signs of the times. Jesus rebuked the religious leaders, said you cannot discern. So how much... For those of us that live in the last days, is it incumbent upon us to discern the signs of the times? You, you and I have to see what happened in the last three years. And, and this is a message that I put together. I shared it at a particular group's national conference just a month ago. And um, this is a national group. They're, they're a prayer organization. And I was amazed at how many of them came up to me afterwards and said, you know, we suspected that, but we never put the pieces together like what you've just done. And uh, so I want to share a little bit of that with you. I saw something last year that I'd never really seen before in the parable of the wheat and the tares. You remember the story where uh, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like uh, a man who sowed good seed in his field. And then he goes all the way through that and he says the enemy sowed bad seed. And so he finishes those parables in Matthew 13 and the disciples come to him and say, explain to us what this parable means. Like, what are you talking about? So in Matthew 13, 24, Jesus starts to explain this parable, and this is what he says. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. Sorry, I'm in the wrong verse. Go down, I'm reading the thing, and I just wanted to get to the interpretation. Go down to verse 38. Jesus explains it. He says, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, the good seed are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age. So this is his explanation. So, so catch a few things here. The first thing we see is this happens at the end of the age. Well, we're there. Doesn't take much to see that. You don't have to be real prophetically strong to go, okay, things are winding down here. The earth can't take a whole lot more. So Jesus then identifies those who are working with the devil. Now catch this part because, you know, I've, I've been a pastor for 36 years. And it, it's always amazing to me that you, you can read something over and over again, and then all of a sudden, one time, it just hits you. And this, this what I'm about to tell you, never hit me till we went into COVID and then into the pandemic that was behind it and what was happening. Jesus identifies those who are working with the devil in the last days as the sons of the wicked one. 
this is people that he's talking about. Right? Come on, don't look at me in that holy tone of voice. He said the tares are the sons of the wicked one. They're people. This is something we don't know how to deal with as a church. What do we do with wicked people? Somebody said to me, well, let me say this first. There are people that are actively working against the plan of God on the earth. They're, they're working as hard as they can. Some of them know what they're doing. Some of them don't. Some of them are ignorant. They're pawns in a much larger scheme. But some of them are, are purposefully working. If you don't think that the devil has a structure that's the antithesis of the church working against what God's plan is, then you need to read your Bible again. Because the sons of the wicked one have been planted here by the enemy, meaning the enemy has a plan. He's doing everything he can to work that plan. And the scriptures are very clear on that, that the spirit of Antichrist was there in the day of Paul. <clears throat> but so much the more as the day approaches, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. What you and I just saw in the last three years was the biggest deception in history. And I'll, I'll walk you through this with some data. And somebody, I was talking about this, that, that, you know, these are people. And somebody said to me, well, our battle's not against flesh and blood. I agree. But what about this? The Bible says that Jesus found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned their tables. Jesus reacted to what wicked men were doing in the temple and he operated in the flesh and kicked them all out. <laughs> Some of you right there, you're like, come on. Now, did he do what was righteous? Yes, he operated, he operated in the flesh. He didn't, what we would say, get in the flesh. But the Bible talked about the zeal for your house has consumed me. And he did that with his fleshly body. Are you following me? I love this because I can already see some of you going, oh, you better fix this part right here, boy. <laughs> so, so what do we do with wicked people? And this is another message. I had to preach a whole message on this in my church because we started talking about what do you do with rulers who are obviously following an agenda that is anti-Christ? The ruler that we've got in this country right now is following an agenda that is doing everything it can to shut the churches down. I've talked to lawyers who've, been, who've worked for one lawyer in particular who has worked for the government of Canada for the last 25 years. She met with, with 12 of us. I'm, I'm part of a group of 12 that meet from across the nation. Um, that, and anyways, we met, and this lawyer came. She's a, a long-term lawyer for the government. Doesn't, it, it almost doesn't matter what party is in power. The substructure underneath the government of the people that help implement policies, lawyers, and all, and all those guys, they work for, for decades in the House or in the, in the government structure in Ottawa. And she told us this, this five years ago, before COVID. She said, we have been told to put together laws and bylaws that foster the LGBTQ agenda in every department of the government. And if a department does not begin to embrace this agenda, then they lose their funding. She also said this, within the next five to 10 years, churches will have to, and I quote, churches will have to use even up to 50% of their annual budget on legal fees because of what's coming towards the churches. The, the government is actively working towards removing the charitable status from churches, and it will happen should the Lord tarry. It's going to happen. Okay? So this was a lawyer. She, she didn't even give us her name. She just said, this is something that you need to know so that you can tell the people that you know to prepare for this. Okay? So this is... So there's people that are working against that agenda. We don't hate them. We don't curse them. But we must work actively against what they're doing. Let me give you a, an illustration. Jesus said that we're the salt of the earth. Salt doesn't have impact until it makes contact. The worst thing we can do right now 
is just back out of all the political processes and say, well, it doesn't matter who gets elected. They're all going to hell anyway, so why should we? It's time for the body of Christ to begin to stand up. We have to stand up. We have to vote. We have to sign petitions. We have to put candidates in office. If we don't do that, we will lose this battle. The same way that Jesus went into the temple and went, wait a minute, it's not right. We have to begin to stand up in this nation and go, wait a minute, that's not right. And there's, there's thank God he's raising up people both saved and unsaved who understand that truth is being subjugated in our nation and they're beginning to stand up. And when we started to move into this a little bit with our church, lo and behold, I had three people in my church who actually ran for the Calgary Board of Education. They said, we just want to get involved. They didn't know anything. They didn't know anything more than I did. But they said, we don't like the way the Board of Education is going. They're teaching sex ed in our schools across this nation that starts in kindergarten. Well, you guys, I mean, I'm looking around at the average age here in the room, and some of you have been around as long as I have, and some a little bit longer. If our generation doesn't stand up, who knows the difference? The next generation that's down there, they think this is part of the normal world and we just live with it. And it's our job and it's our watch and it's our time to stand up and go, no, wait a minute, this is not going to happen on my watch. You and I are here for this time. We could have been born 200 years ago when the earth was nice and things were easy and there wasn't so much stress and there wasn't so much pressure, but God put you and me here at this time because he thought, I'm going to put something in that generation that has the guts to stand up and, and face the music no matter what. So as I said, interesting, um, we have right now in Canada the most corrupt government that, it, that we've ever had in Canadian history. But think about this. There's more people praying for Canada right now than ever before in our history. If praying was all it took, things would be different, Christians. And I'm, I'm, I mean, you guys have been around for a while. You've got a mature pastor and a mature church. So I'm speaking to you as mature Christians. I'm speaking to you as a group of people that you have roots in Christianity and you have roots in your heart and in your strength that you can handle some of the things that I'm about to say to you. Because I believe it's time for us to stand up. I won't get time to tell a little bit of our story. I may share this tonight. Let me give you the bad news first, okay? I have over 1,600 emails that I've collected in researching what was happening in the last three years with videos, reports, interviews, source data, and scientific studies done by globally recognized doctors, scientists, virologists, and epidemiologists. They collectively agree that what happened in the last three years is the biggest deception in the history of mankind. As soon as these individuals, and I'm talking, we had one lady that spoke recently, uh, you guys had Laura Lynn. Tyler Thompson here, right? So Laura Lynn, I know Laura Lynn. We've known each other for about seven years. And, and Laura Lynn wanted to do three uh, seminars, so she did one in Calgary. She used our church. She did one in Red Deer. She did one in Vancouver. One of the doctors that she had there um, is a, a leading expert in Canada and North America in what's called immunogenetics. Immunogenetics is the study of the immune system from the genetic or your genome structure. So they go right back to the very roots of what causes us to be uh, immune to things and how do you strengthen and develop your, uh, your immune system. These kinds of people, she said, I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm within the top three experts in the nation. And she said, the government never even called me to ask about the mRNA vaccine or about what was happening. She said they never even, she said myself and one other guy who was also there, she said neither of us was ever even called to ask, okay, what do we do with this thing that actually could affect the genome structure of a human being? And she said, I've been doing this for three decades. I know my stuff. Um, so it's interesting when you hear that, when these people started to report what they were finding, the real science, they were banned from all social media, they were branded as kooks and extremists, and many of them were fired from their positions. Hmm. Why didn't we have both sides of the narrative? Why didn't, why didn't we have honest scientific dialogue between experts on both sides? If you'll notice, when you listen to the legacy media, you only ever got one side. So I don't know about you, uh, from what I understand, people in this part of the country are the salt of the earth. In other words, you guys think a little bit closer to common sense. 
You get into the big cities, you get into Toronto and stuff, and people just get, I, I think it's, there's just more demons per kilometer, I think. It's just people just, <laughs> people just get, get weird, you know. But their persistence in bringing out the truth now after three years has revealed something, and they all said this. And some of them aren't even saved. Some of them aren't Christians. But they, they've, they studied the science, and they've done it for years and years, and, and when the things were presented, and they've, they've said this, we were lied to. We were lied to in the last three years. Let me explain. As of April 19th, four days ago, there have been 763 million cases of COVID reported. Of that number, just under 7 million have died. That's 1%. The regular flu kills 1% every year. Right? You see the stats? You can look this up for yourself. Go to the World Health Organization, type in COVID deaths as of April. I just updated this. I, I shared it a month ago, and I just updated it last night just to see, okay, what's the, what were the stats now? 1% same as the regular flu. Yet as of this month, the World Health Organization claims that 5.6 billion people have been vaccinated. Interestingly enough, this came out within the first 18 months that the World Health Organization confirmed this, that the vaccination does not guarantee immunity from SARS-CoV-19. That's what they said on their website. I don't know about you, but I'm like, okay, you know, if, I, if this thing makes me not get sick, but it didn't guarantee immunity. So then it makes you think, okay, well then, what's going on here? Here's the truth, and I have to change the words here because the, the bots on YouTube and the other uh, things pick up certain code words, and then they'll shut that, you, that video down. So let's call, let's call the thing uh, the flu instead of the C-O-V-I-D, <coughs> which the bots won't pick up. The issue was never about the flu. It was about the agenda of the globalists to determine the decree of control that people would accept in taking a, not a V-A-C-C-I-N-E, in taking a solution <clears throat> that they didn't, listen, that they didn't have a choice to refuse without serious consequences. For the first time globally, people were forced to obey or be fired from their jobs. Families were divided on what was right and what was wrong. Businesses were destroyed. Churches split and closed. Lockdowns, quarantines, and restrictions stopped travel. And seniors died alone in homes because no one was allowed in to comfort them when they got sick. It was diabolical, it was demonic, and it was merciless. But let me back up and give you some scriptural basis. Revelation 13 says... That when Antichrist comes, he's given authority over every tribe, every tongue, and every nation, and that he will implement a global system that controls the economies of the world. Right? That's in your Bible on your lap. That's what it says, that there is coming a world ruler. Whenever he comes, I'm not even going to go there, but, but there is coming a time in somebody's generation where a guy is going to run the economic systems of the world and punish anyone who does not work with his system. He will shut them off and they can neither buy nor sell without the mark or the number of his name or the worship of the beast. Right? That's in the Bible. Yep. So, so this isn't, we're not conspiracy stuff here. This comes right out of Revelation that there's a system that's going to be set up over, and it says here that he's given authority over every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. So he is going to have authority for a period of time over everybody. And the Bible talks about the martyrs and the things that are going to happen then. We are in the process, I submit to you, of seeing those elements be put in place. But again, we get, need to dig a little bit deeper. The enemy has been working hard to control the finances of the world and to a large degree has done so since the late 1800s. Let me give you an example. Meyer Amschel Rothschild, who lived in Britain in the 1800s, said this, Give me control of a nation's money and I care not who makes its laws. The Rothschilds dynasty has been a global arms dealer for 200 years and amongst many other things has funded both sides of war, World War II. The wealth of the Rothschilds is a well-hidden secret and they keep it that way. 
Any serious investigation will show you that they and a number of other families run the global banking empires. Here's the research where you can verify what I'm saying. In a well-researched book called The Federal Reserve Cartel, published February 11, 2014, the author, Dean Henderson, said regarding eight of these families, and I quote, the control that these banking families exert over the global economy cannot be overstated and is quite intentionally shrouded in secrecy. Their corporate media arm is quick to discredit any information exposing this private central banking cartel as conspiracy theory, yet the facts remain, unquote. Again, for you to do your own research, Dean Henderson, the Federal Reserve Cartel, published in February the 11th, 2014. I just went online, I just punched that in, uh, and sure enough, that book came right up, and uh, it's, so all that stuff is there as he, he exhaustively digs into what's actually happening in the economic structures of the world. Now, think about this for a minute. If the devil is smart, he will create a system that's the same as God's in reverse, because God's systems work. So, and it's an interesting concept, but if you think God's system works with authority figures. There's, there's archangels, and then there's angels. And then there's, other, there's layers of authority. The same is true in the church. Paul talked about firstly apostles, after that prophets, then uh, evangelists, pastors, teachers. So there's an authority. Sometimes you get somebody that gets up here and they preach with a 500 gigawatt anointing, and then somebody else comes and preaches, and they preach and they're okay, and it's kind of like, well, that was nice. Well, there's a different level of authority even in preaching and teaching gifts, isn't there? Those are, that's just, it's just a natural thing. We don't, we don't say anybody's worth less or not as good, but it's obvious that there's an... So the devil has the same thing in his kingdom. There are levels of authority. The madman of Gadara had over 2,000 spirits in him. But there was other ones that Jesus just said, deaf and dumb spirits, shut up and come out. The guy, so there's one spirit. So again, you can see there's levels of authority. The Antichrist, the Bible says, will be possessed by the spirit of the enemy himself, however that works. Right? So are you following my... So the devil's system is a reverse of God's, which means that there's people here on the earth who have a demonic spiritual authority that they can use. And if you've, if you've talked to anybody who is involved heavily in the occult, somebody who was a witch or a warlock and didn't just play around the, the fringes, but actually saw things, cast spells, moved in the spirit, they go to other places in the spirit, they change form. You guys, it's no mystery why we're seeing what we're seeing in the movies right now. What we're seeing in the movies is the manifestation of the dark side in the spiritual things as people are able to, to shape shift or form shift and go into another thing. Read about people who've been involved deeply in the occult and they talk about the ability to leave their body and go to another part of the earth and put a curse on somebody or to manifest as a particular kind of animal or a particular kind of bird and go somewhere and then re-manifest re in their body. And most of the church in, in North America, if you're from other countries, like we've got people in our church from Africa, and they say, when you talk about these things, we know these things. We deal with these things in Africa. We have, we have stuff that's, you know, bad news. So we have to realize that, that that's happening, they got, that the devil would use people. So let me give you something else. David Rockefeller, whose family is one of those eight, died just six years ago in 2017. David said this, and again, I quote, some people believe that we are a part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists, which is where we get the word globalists, and of conspiring with others around the world, listen, to build a more integrated global political and economic structure, one world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. These are people that operate in trillions of dollars. These families and their subsidiaries, listen to this, you find this interesting. These families and their subsidiaries have created and run the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Federal Reserve, the CIA, the World Economic Forum. Good old Klaus Schwab is the head of the World Economic Forum right now, created by the globalists. <clears throat> the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the Bank of International Settlements, and the World Health Organization. Huh, here's something interesting. The World Health Organization was created and funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, which is a globalist entity. 
Okay. So what's interesting here, the World Health Organization is supposed to set the global standard for health and medical assistance for all people in every country, isn't it? It's like everybody looks to the World Health Organization. The Canadian health system looked to the World Health Organization. What are we supposed to do? But if you go deeper in the policies of the World Health Organization, here's what you find. Their policies include universal abortion access, the training of children as young as four in inclusive sexuality. Do you wonder why there's a, there's a push right now for our little children to be taught that it's okay that you're not really a boy? Where they get books that are like Bobby's new dress and Susie's toy truck? Because the World Health Organization wants to teach the next generation that you don't have to be a girl and don't have to be a boy. This is in their policies. <laughs> Some of you are like, okay, I'm done. Can we go home now? <laughs> Continuing on, the promotion of transgenderism. World Health Organization, what are they doing with gender? Why aren't they just taking care of people and making them get well? Because it's a globalist organization founded by the Rockefellers who have a one world agenda that they openly said, I'm proud of this. The last one it says is the legalization of prostitution around the world. Why do you think that our government has been looking to try and legalize prostitution? Because they're reading from the playbook of the globalist group. You have to, you guys, you have to see behind the veil. Once you see behind the veil, all the stuff that's happening, you go, oh, okay, well, that's, that's the agenda of the globus. That's the agenda of the World Health Organization. Once you see the roots, everything starts to make sense. When we had, we had this thing at our church last Saturday, a week ago, and with Laura Lynn and these four scientists, brilliant people. One of them wasn't saved at all. And, and I asked him, I said, so, he's a, and he's a brilliant doctor. He had the, 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 the third most successful cancer clinic in North America in Edmonton. He said, we had the highest outpatient rate of any other cancer clinic in, I mean, this guy's brilliant. He's got like three PhDs. I mean, you know, these guys are just like, you talk to these guys and, and you say, okay, that word you just said, can I have a paragraph on what that word you just said means? And we got talking at lunch. Um, and I got to go in with him because I was a pastor of the church. I said, you bet I'm going in. I'm going to talk to these guys. It's always good to talk to somebody smarter than you, you know, because when you say what they say, people think you're as smart as they are. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I said to him, so uh, what do you think is the reason behind this? Because I wanted to see what he knows. He said, well, I think it's money. I think it's because they're making, they're making billions of dollars. Every vaccine that's sold makes, makes uh, the country uh, money, right? So the more they, and so it's, uh, but, but what was interesting is that, that that was as far as he could go because he's not a believer. He doesn't know the Bible. He doesn't know that there's an enemy that's working to subvert the kingdom of God. We're the only ones that can go to the root of what's happening in our world right now. Because we have the Bible, and one-third of the Bible is prophecy, and the Lord told us these things so that when it came in the last days, we would not be unawares. And we have to be able to see that. The globalists believe that the world cannot sustain its rapidly growing population, and therefore, population control measures must be implemented to stem the tide of growth. They have openly stated that the ideal population of the world is 500 million people. That means about 7.5 bill of us have to die. Well, I'm not quite ready. I turned 62 this coming Friday. I used to think 62 was old. Like, you know, when you turn 60, just go home and lie down, because how long is it going to be? <laughs> and then I turned 60, and I was like, wait a minute. So the countries whose governments are being controlled by the globalists are implementing several things. Listen to what's happening in Canada right now. Full-term abortion access. Why? Because we want to stop people from having babies. We need to stop this baby thing from happening. There's too many babies. Get rid of these babies. They now actually have something called post-birth abortion. Some of you have heard of it. It just got voted on. I believe it was in the UK. 
Post-birth abortion, you know what that means? It means when the baby comes out and the mom says, I don't want the baby, they let it die in the hospital room. This is an actual scientific term. They took it away from infanticide or murder, which is what it used to be, and they call it post-birth abortion. We just let the baby die. Why? Because this is what the globalists want. Now, again, you got to back up to something here. What did, what did the Lord say to Adam and Eve? Be fruitful and multiply. Right? Be fruitful. Multiply. What is the devil doing? Everything in reverse. Let's kill as many of them as we can. Let's start a world war. Let's, let's release AIDS. Let's release this. Why? Let's kill them off. I lost my position close to you, and you love these guys enough to become one of them, and I'm going to kill them off. As a matter of fact, I'm going to deceive them so badly that they don't even know if they're their genetic reality anymore. There's 6,500 genome differences between a male and a female. 6,500. Doesn't matter how many things you cut off or add on. <laughs> you're still a boy, and you're still a girl. Here's an interesting thing. All the bones in our body are identical in males and females, except the pelvis. The pelvic, and those of you that are medical people know that the pelvic girdle is different in women than it is in men because it's designed to protect the new baby. So you can't make a woman into a man by, you know, snip, snip, inject, inject. You just can't, you, you can't do it. But the devil has so twisted the minds of the world that they think, well, if I feel like a girl, I must be. How many of you have heard of the school in Ontario where they have kitty litter in the bathrooms? Do you know why they have the kitty litter? Because people are identifying as kitty cats. I'm, I'm a kitty cat today. No, you're a wombat. See, we have to see, it's the, why would people do that? Why would, why would people do that? Well, do you remember what you were like as a teenager? Dear God, I, I remember as a teenager, I was a hormone going somewhere to happen. I didn't know from up. I didn't know what I, didn't know what I was good at or what I was bad at. I didn't have any, you know, strong, I, was th I always threw myself into sports because I got my, my, my self-image from sports. I got my confidence and my... But, but I remember people that the, 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 the number or the degree of teenage suicide in the generation that we're now watching is higher than any other generation because of the deception that's come down. Because so you have to go back again. What is the enemy doing underneath this to make it happen? Why is it happening? He wants to kill people. He wants people to die so that he can go against what God said. How about this one? Euthanasia. Let's call out, C-U-L-L, -L, the old, the infirm, the weak, and the handicapped. Did you know that Canada now has the most liberal laws in the world regarding killing people? Yeah. And I don't know, you might be able to correct me on this uh, or update me. The government, the last I read, was pushing for same-day euthanasia for depressed, mentally challenged, or even teenagers who are having a bad day. They could walk into a clinic, the old law used to be they could walk into a clinic and say, I want this, and they had to wait a certain number of days. They are in the process, our government right now, is in the process of removing that waiting period so that someone who's depressed or mentally challenged can walk into a clinic without parental assent and say, I don't want to live anymore, my life is not worth it, and they will inject that person, and thank God there's doctors across the nation standing up against this saying, we're not doing this. I'm, I'm going to tell you something that's going to happen. We may touch on it tonight. But there's, there's righteous doctors, whether they're saved or not, that their conscience, our doctors are being pushed. 150 doctors have died in the last two and a half years from unknown causes. But our doctors, and I know because I've got some in my church, our doctors are coming to the place where they're having to stand up and go, okay, there's a line. I won't do that. I will not give a teenager, a 15-year-old who's having a bad day, a shot that kills him. And within hours, he's a corpse and they take him out. That's what's happening in our world right now. How about this one, the gender reassignment issue? If, why, why are we facing the gender issue? If they can get young people to have hormone therapy and have their sexual organs removed, whether male or female, they become incapable of reproduction. <laughs> like, it, it, it's almost funny if it wasn't so tragic. It's so obvious when you see the reasons behind and what the enemy is doing. 
Some of you know this. Klaus Schwab, the leader of the World Economic Forum, created by none other than the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, and the Morgans, recently bragged, we are so proud of Prime Minister Trudeau because we've penetrated half of his cabinet with the young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. Quote, unquote. He said that. We are so proud of Prime Minister Trudeau. Because what's happening on our federal government, on his cabinet, which is the leading ministers in the nation responsible for the most important portfolios, is that those guys have a globalist agenda. So they're going along with everything because they've got half the cabinet. Dear God, aren't you glad you came to church this morning? <laughs> And you know what's funny, because I've only preached this three or four times, and I'm, I'm sure, and, and people come up to me afterwards, they're like, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it all along, I knew, and then sometimes they go way off into other stuff, and I'm like, whoa, back up there, let's just, let's go back to what we know here. Once you see the agenda they've stated in their documents, what our pres you find out what our present government is doing becomes perfectly clear. How about the latest bill that our government is trying to put through, or maybe they already have, I, I haven't been updated on this, that they control what our internet says. Do you know the only other countries in the world that do that are communist China and communist North Korea. It's like somebody said who was in the States, you know, they were talking about Canada and maybe moving to Canada and you know whether we should or not, and they said, but I've been too much information now about China. -da. The COVID deception and the plan Vax has been their first global attempt at worldwide population control in modern history. We learned 30 years ago from an end times guy who was born and raised in um, New Zealand. And he got connected with people who were connected in the global things, a banking industry. He said this 30 years ago in a church service just like this. He said... Australia and Canada are the two countries that are going to be used over the next few years, and we've seen a number of times this time to be, as the test cases for implementing global restrictions, implementing global initiatives is a better word. And he gave us the reasons. He said they're, they're both big countries with a very small population. He said not only do they have a very small population, but they only have three or four banks. America has thousands of banks. We had six, and then the Royal Bank went under recently, about a year and a half ago, and was purchased by Scotiabank. So now we have five national banks. Australia has four national banks. So it's very easy to control the banking structure when you only have four national banks. And the other thing that they said 30 years ago, they said, the guy said that Australia and Canada both have fairly... I'm not sure if passive is the right word, but fairly non-aggressive populations. That's us, right? We're so polite. We're just really polite to everybody, and we're polite. And, and you know what we do when we're polite and we're ticked off as Canadians? We complain. We, we complain politely, but we complain. The Lord convicted me of that some time ago when we were walking into this. He said, you complain too much. I was like, Lord, I'm a pastor. Pastors don't complain. <laughs> and then the Lord said this to my heart, and I didn't think it was him at first. He said, my son never complained once. And immediately I started thinking, well, there's that in the Bible, you know, because it's got to be, like, is it in there? Is it? And I thought, what about when he said, you brood of vipers, you hypocrites, he wasn't complaining he was speaking truth to them to say, you guys are going the wrong way. What about when he said, you know, Herod, the, the disciples came and said, you need to get out of here because Herod says, you know, Herod's going to come after you. And Jesus said, you go tell that fox. Was he complaining? No, he spoke the truth. Never complained. Never complained one time. When we complain, we fuel the spirits that work against the purposes of God in the earth. Let me finish. Three things that I realized that are, have been revealed to us in the last three years. There is a strategy to impose greater control over population groups by governments. 
masking, quarantines, travel restrictions, gathering limits, the right to attend public events and places only if you have the certificate. That was done in the Second World War by Hitler, first of all to the Jews, and first thing they did was they killed the mentally retarded. The Nazis began to eliminate the mentally retarded because they weren't fit to live, and they didn't match up to the perfect um, Aryan human. Same thing. Then they began to implement restrictions in Nazi Germany that unless you had a particular certificate and it was based on health. You do the research. I've got 1,600 emails as I've gone through this stuff in the last three years that they use it based on health. If you didn't have their, their qualification for what health was, you couldn't go into a restaurant. How many of you missed going into restaurants over the course of the last couple of years? So you know what we did in our church? We came up with religious exemptions. We had people come to our church that weren't even saved and say, I, 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 what do I do with this? And I said, we'll write you a religious exemption. Some of them were accepted, some of them weren't. But I remember wanting to go to the keg. We have, you know, in Alberta, we, the steak is our thing, right? We have good beef in Alberta. You know, I come here, I eat seafood. I just know, you know, it's like, just give me seafood because I love seafood. I don't know why God put me in the prairies, but anyways. So I went, I phoned the guy up and I, and I said, because uh, I'm not vaccinated myself, and I said, um, so can, I, can we come there if we don't have the certificate? He goes, well, no. I said, what if we have a legal exemption? He goes, oh, yeah, you can come if you have a legal exemption. You know why? Because the restaurants are struggling, right? So I went out and printed off the legal exemption that I was giving to everybody else, and I just signed it. And when you read my signature, you can't tell that it's mine because my name and my signature don't look anything. And I just signed this thing off, and I got through the thing and showed it to him, and, and they go, okay, great, come on in. Now, let me say something right here. I don't fuss over vaccinated or non-vaccinated or mask or no mask. We had to go through all that. Everybody had to go through all that. So for me, it wasn't about that. It was about the agenda that was happening behind that was causing us to make decisions that we didn't want to make. That I have to do this or lose my job? Wait a minute, there's a constitutional thing going on here. You can't, that I can't travel? I love to travel. Part of my ministry is called to travel, and I couldn't travel for two years. Billy was telling me that, that uh, many of you couldn't go off the island. You're stuck here on the island for two years, couldn't go across the bridge. That is a direct violation of our constitutional rights. And the issue is so much bigger than health. There's something else going on. Let me finish on a happy note so that those of you who have to take pills for depression don't walk out and... <laughs> well, I'm not coming back tonight because, man, if he's going to talk about that again, I'm going to be depressed all week. The second thing, the first thing was a strategy to impose greater control. We're seeing that, and people are starting to fight back. Thank God the world is starting to fight back and go, wait a minute, something wrong here. There's a gender strategy targeted specifically on Western nations to advance the LGBTQ agenda in all areas of society. That's why it's happening in our schools. There's a global strategy to subjugate economies through financial controls and the implementation of a digital ID and digital currencies. We are moving towards digital currency. Whether we see it in the next two years or the next 10 years, I'm not saying, but we're definitely moving towards it. <clears throat> and in case you don't know it yet, the mainstream media organizations have been given a specific narrative that supports all the global things. If you're watching the mainstream media and you're afraid, your fear is self-induced. I'll say that again. If you're watching the mainstream media, your fear is self-induced. Because the mainstream media is the voice of the enemy right now. Interesting thing. The Bible says that God does nothing but what he tells his prophets. Who do you think are the prophets of the enemy? Because the enemy mirrors whatever God's doing. What is the enemy the Lord of? What is he the prince of the power of? The air. What is that? You look up the word aeon in the Bible, and it's the swirling mass of thoughts, opinions, perceptions, maxims, and desires of humanity. In other words, he's the swirling mass of those things that go through our mind that determine culture, determines what you wear, determines the kind of glasses. It's so funny to me. Wingtip glasses are, are here again for girls. Remember they were out the first time? Wingtip glasses. And now they're in again. And I'm like... Don't wear them. You look like a grandma. You're 12, you know, you're, you're 25 years old. You got wingtip glasses. Now, if you got wingtip glasses on, just chill. <laughs> but we've all been around long enough to see these cycles come around again. That's culture. Culture is determined by the prince of the power of the air. 
That's why you got a whole bunch of people that will, you know, wear biker stuff. And then you got a whole bunch of people that will dress. Why? Because it's culture, and that's what, the, what's, that's what the devil is the lord of. So he influences our minds, and he uses magazines and internet and the media and newspapers and all that to do it. <clears throat> I watched something where 25 evening news broadcasts from different parts of the world said the exact same sentence regarding a particular issue that was happening in the same sentence. I'm talking about in North America, in Europe, and all these, they were given the same line. And the guy was like, so who's giving them all the very same line? And he proved it. He just showed on his video. He just said, they're all getting news, that their, their feed from the same source. Why? Because people have to be told over and over and over and over and over again what the truth is so that they'll finally change and, and embrace that truth as their truth. What was the purpose of the enemy? It was to get our eyes off of the Lord. It was to get our eyes on what's happening on the world. How many of you met, went through the hopelessness? I saw for the first time, and experienced for the first time. In my, and why don't you stand up, because you've been sitting for a while. I saw in my own church that I've pastored for 30 years, I saw a hopelessness in people that I'd never seen before. Absolutely dejected. What's going to happen? You know, I got asked more questions about revelation in the last three years than the whole rest of my 36 years of ministry put together. People ask, people come up and say, ah, I got the vaccine. Is this the mark of the beast? <laughs> I had to tell them, no, it's not the mark of the beast. <laughs> but there's a system being set up to see, do you know they tried to tell us all to get the vaccine in, H, in, uh, in, uh, in 2017? 80% of, can, of Canadians refused, whatever it was for, whatever it was, it was one of the, you know, latest flus, like Brother Copeland says, swine flu. He says, who wants to get the flu off of swine anyways? 80% <laughs> of Canadians said, no, I'm not getting it. We don't know enough about it. This time, 70% of Canadians said yes. And you think, okay, so they pushed us before and we pushed back. Now they're pushing us again. And are we pushing back? Are we starting yet to push back? Are you starting yet to push back? Or are you just quiet, you know, PE Islanders and you just love Jesus, go to church there and we, we just do what we do and we pray? We need to move to the next level. I'll finish with this thought. God is going like this right now. He, I'm telling you, how many of you know what's happening in Asbury? Asbury College, I have a friend who's an evangelical, doesn't believe in all the tongue stuff and everything like that, but we're good friends. And he said to me, he said, you need to understand something. Asbury is the, the theologian's college of the theologians. He said, Asbury is the place where if you go there and you get your degree in theology, he said, you, you will be accepted in virtually any evangelical, because it is they, I mean, it is they train you, boy, with the stuff. And of all places where God could be, in case you don't know, the spirit of prayer was poured out in that place and the students began to pray all day and all night, weeping and crying and praying and singing out. And then it began to spread to other colleges. There's over a hundred colleges now that have been touched by that revival. It's made the news. It made even some of the national news about this revival that's happening in this place. And I may, I may be able to share a little bit more of that tonight. But what I'm telling you is, we were born for this day. This is our time. There's a revival that's, that's, that's coming, the Bible says, that eclipses all the rest of the revivals put together. Something is coming towards us. So when we're seeing the bad right now, the Lord is telling the church, lift up your eyes because I'm doing something good. And what we had to do was come through this and go, wait a minute, bless God, I'm not in this for what happens down here. And if I die, I die. But bless God, I'm going to pray and I'm going to stand and I'm going to walk this thing through and we're going to see something happen. And, and we're, we're hearing of it. You know what we've seen in our church in, since January? We've seen more people get delivered than ever before. I'm talking about you come down the prayer line, you know, shandai, 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 shandai. And then some guy goes, ah. I'm kind of like, <laughs> come out, ah, ah, boom, down on the floor. <laughs> Five minutes later, he's like, oh, oh. And I thought the guy, thank God he wasn't an elder. Can you imagine we pray for your elders? And one of the elders starts doing the, doing the funky chicken. And, the... and my associate pastor, and he's the one that gets them all the time. My associate, I'm glad. When somebody starts to manifest, I'm like, Pastor Clive, here you go, right here. Come on. 
Susie's got some critters here. Come and help her out. But I'm looking at that, and I'm going, God in heaven is going, because he's turning up the juice, you guys. And when he's turning, and this is what I'm going to talk about tonight, about some supernatural things that are coming, uh, and that we've already, we've seen traits of. I'm going to share a couple of Brother Hagin stories. I, I, I went to, to Rama for two years and sat at the feet of Kenneth Hagin and just, and heard him tell, he taught us, he said, it's called spiritology. And he said, I can't give you any books on this because nobody's written any. And then he started telling us about things that happened in his church. And then when we went through the revival uh, uh, a, two, a decade ago, a couple of decades ago, we started to see some of those things happen in the church. And, and, and the Lord was saying, this is the John the Baptist anointing compared to the Jesus anointing. I thought, oh my goodness. I mean, I remember one time sitting on the edge of the stage and the presence of the Lord was so sweet in the worship. I looked out. And probably 50% of the church was all just laid on the floor. And nobody said lay down. Nobody said, oh, the, the anointing is here. Nobody said any of that. And I'm sitting on the, on the stage with my eyes closed going, God, what do I do? 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 Because I didn't know what to do. Because his presence was so strong. And, and then things began to happen. But that's where we're going. And so we'll share a little bit of that tonight. So if you're able to come, we believe you'll be blessed. Let me pray for you. <laughs> Lord, I pray for the spirit of depression right now that's tried to enter into the building. <laughs> Father, you are the ruler of all of this, but you told us that we needed to be aware of the enemy's devices. And so as I've pulled the veil back here to expose the dark side, I just thank you right now that no matter where everybody's at, what they can receive, they receive. What they can't receive is fine. You, you, you walk with Jesus and you trust him and we all walk together and we all believe God together. But Lord, we see, we don't see the darkness. We see the darkness, but then we see the light that, that is, is beginning to shine in this world. And we restore the truth and the hope for the people that are around us, many of whom have given up hope. They've lost their businesses. Their families are divided. There's confusion. There's uncertainty. But you said that we are the light of the world and we're the salt of the earth. And we choose to be that in these days that are coming. And we lift our eyes up from the mud of low tide to when the waves begin to come in and high tide comes and you always come at high tide. You always come when the water washes over top the mud and the boats begin to float. That's when you come and we're looking forward to that. I pray your blessing and a spirit of awareness and prophetic understanding upon all of us today in this church as we go forward. I thank you for it. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Billy.